This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good evening and welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Speaker Series. My name is Cheryl Peach and I'm a program scientist here at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego. It's a great pleasure to have you all here this evening um, and to welcome our speaker, Dr. Diego Melgar. Uh, it really is a pleasure because Diego's one of our own. He's actually, actually an alum of Scripps. Uh, last year he received his PhD in geophysics um, and he spent the last year at UC Berkeley working in the, with the seismology group there. We're quite proud of him. I was talking to Diego and in doing a little research on him, was really astonished at his achievements. Uh, this early in his career, he has uh, authorship on nearly 20 publications, which is really phenomenal, just a year out of his PhD. Um, and uh, moreover, he won the Freeman Award, which is awarded for excellence in uh, publication the preceding year to a Scripps graduate student. I want to read you the title of his talk, Near Field Tsunami Models with Rapid Earthquake Source Inversions from Land and Ocean-Based Observations, the Potential for for Forecast and Warning. And so in simple terms, in Diego's own words, in fact, he's interested in the simple question of, how can we know as much as possible about large earthquakes in the least amount of time? So I think you'll <laughs> learn more about that. Um, so it's very appropriate to have Diego here to speak to us tonight, uh, tonight in advance of the great shakeout. Please join me in welcoming Diego for his talk titled, The Really Big One. All right. Thank you, Cheryl, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's my very great pleasure to be back here at the Birch Aquarium after a short time away. So tonight we're going to take a step back and I'm going to tell you a little bit about an earthquake or rather a, a part of the United States that's been in the news um, quite a bit in terms of seismology. And when I'm, as I'm sure you all are very well versed um, folk in terms of earthquakes and seismology, we're used to talking about the San Andreas, about the faults that are close to LA and San Francisco and California. But lately, due to a very well written piece, I think, in the, in the New Yorker um, titled The Really Big One, which lends its title to this talk, um, Really, it's been the Pacific Northwest, so Oregon, Northern California, Oregon, and the state of Washington that have been in the news. And we're not used to talking about them nearly as much as we are about California, but I hope to impress upon you that we really should. So just before we get started, I'm going to be talking about the Cascadia subduction zone. All I mean by that is the Pacific Northwest. And the reason that we're talking about this is because rather dramatically in this New Yorker piece, this was billed as the earthquake that will destroy Seattle and then very dramatically torn away from the page. So I'm going to read to you first um, a couple of uh, excerpts from this article so that you can uh, get a feel for what we're talking about. Um, it says, it reads in the piece, we now know that the odds of the big Cascadia earthquake, a magnitude 8, those are my parentheses, happening in the next 50 years are roughly 1 in 3. And the odds of the very big one, a magnitude 9, are roughly 1 in 10. So those are fairly alarming numbers if you really stop to think about it. The 1906 earthquake in California was a magnitude 8 and that was very much devastating. So what are we going to talk about today. I'll step back and I'll tell you about how we know that the Cascadia subduction zone can, can create these very large earthquakes. It's a very uh, interesting story that very beautifully illustrates how the scientific method works in the earth sciences that I'm, I think you will enjoy. And then after spending quite a bit of time talking to you about these things, then we'll switch over 
to what impacts can we expect from such large earthquakes and what can we do about it going forward. As Cheryl said, don't be scared, be prepared. So let's get started with how do we know that Cascadia can make these uh, very big earthquakes. To situate you in just what kind of thing we're talking about, um, these are the, what is depicted here are the rupture areas, the sizes of the faults of some famous California earthquakes that many of you might have felt. There's a Napa earthquake last year, a magnitude 6.1, the Northridge earthquake in northern LA, a magnitude 6.7, the Loma Prieta earthquake, the World Series earthquake of 1989, a magnitude 6.9, the Landers earthquake 7.3, and then the April earthquake from four years ago, the Mexicali earthquake, which many of you might have felt, I certainly felt it when I was here as a, as a student, this magnitude 7.2. So 7.2 for California is a large, large earthquake. Now notice that scale bar there at the top, that's about 20 miles. So the size of this very large, by California standards, very large fault is roughly 100 miles or so. So that's the distance between here and LA. So the whole fault was that long. Now when we compare these uh, rather large California earthquakes to the truly large earthquakes that happen around the world, this is what they look like. This scale is now about 100 miles and compare that to the 2010 magnitude 8.8 .8 Chile earthquake, the 2011 very devastating Japan earthquake in magnitude 9, and the 2004 uh, Boxing Day earthquake in Sumatra in Indonesia, a magnitude 9.1, 9.2. These are very, very big events. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the earthquakes in, in Cascadia. So when we talk about the magnitude eights and nines, we're talking about these sizes of earthquakes, much, much larger than what we're used to seeing in California. Now, another reason why this piece um, drew a lot of traction with, with the press was because it had statements like, like these. Uh, this is a direct quote from, from the piece. It's quoting uh, the FEMA's Region 10 director, Kenneth Murphy. He says that by the time the shaking has ceased and the tsunami has receded, the region will be unrecognizable. He says our operating assumption is that everything west of Interstate 5 will be toast. So this made lots of people nervous because when you look at a map, <laughs> this is everything west of Interstate 5. So about 60 miles wide by about 600 miles long, that's a lot of real estate. So statements such as these, you know, should not be taken lightly if they're qualified correctly. And they are. So these sorts of uh, rupture length, 600 miles, why they don't happen, while they don't happen very often, are not unheard of. We saw this in 2004 in Indonesia. So I'd like to take you through how do we know that an earthquake of this uh, dimension can happen there? So to do so, it's important to understand exactly what Cascadia is. Now this is an animation that I've uh, borrowed from IRIS. This is a, a nonprofit uh, association for seismology that illustrates what we might expect during an earthquake. So the oceanic plate subducts, dives beneath the continent. So this would be the Pacific Northwest. And as it does so, it's pinned by friction. It can't move. So strain begins to accumulate. And over the centuries, over decades, it builds and it builds and it builds until suddenly it is released in about a minute or two, maybe three minutes. And then all that strain generates the strong shaking that is perceived during earthquakes. And it also generates this uplift of the seafloor that makes the tsunami. So that's more or less how uh, subduction zones operate. And Cascadia is no exception. Now, you might find yourself thinking, why haven't I heard more about this? Or why isn't this more present in people's minds when we think about earthquake hazards? And the reason is that for a long time, we, we weren't totally sure that Cascadia could make big earthquakes. And the reason for that is, can be illustrated by looking at other subduction zones. So subduction zones are not rare. There, there's thousands upon thousands of miles of subduction zones all over the world. This is the Japanese subduction zone. And the easiest way to pinpoint them is by looking at the shape of the seafloor. And this is something that script scientists are very good at. So when an oceanic plate, this guy, subducts beneath what is known as a continental plate, this guy, they make this very simple to see shape. It's called a trench. These are the deepest places in the ocean. The Marianas Trench, where James Cameron likes to go diving, is one example of them. So this is the, 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 the trench offshore of the Japanese subduction zone. Very easy to spot. Telltale feature that subduction is going on there. This is another example offshore Indonesia, where we had the 2004 earthquake. In this case, the oceanic plate moves from left to right, and it subducts over this uh, continental plate. 
Another simple example in South America, very, very long subduction zones, thousands of kilometers long. You see this subduction of the oceanic plate beneath the continent of South America. Same thing in Mexico and Central America. This is what makes big earthquakes that have been famous in Central Mexico and in, and in Central America. Same thing in Alaska. And the, the motif here is that these things are very, very common. So this is the same thing that made the uh, 1965 Alaskan earthquake. And then we take a look at Cascadia and these sorts of, you know, very obvious trench features, they're there, but they're not as conspicuous as they are in other subduction zones. Indeed, Cascadia is a subduction zone. There is an oceanic plate moving from left to right and subducting beneath this continental plate. But there is an additional mystery about Cascadia and that is that it's a very quiet place. And what do I mean by that is if we take at a look at one month of seismicity on any of these subduction zones that I've, that I've talked about, in this case I'll exemplify this with Alaska, this is a month of earthquakes in the Alaskan subduction zone. These are 2.5s up to maybe 4s and 5s, so not al always felt, not destructive at all. But there's always something going on. There's always some chattering going on. Even in between large events, subduction zones are always moving. They're very, very loud places, seismically speaking. And then when we take a look at Cascadia, there's nothing or very, very, very little. So this phenomenon that there is very little seismicity in Cascadia is what led people after the discovery of plate tectonics in the 60s to think that maybe this subduction zone, um, this had been a subduction zone at one point and was now abandoned and was just, you know, not going to make uh, big earthquakes anymore. And that was a prevailing wisdom uh, throughout maybe the late 80s. And then it started to change. And the reason that it started to change is if we go back to this movie, um, notice what's important is that during these large earthquakes, this part, I'm going to rewind this, this part sinks. This part of the coast sinks during the large earthquake. So this part of the coast moves up and another part of the coast moves down. And that turns out to be an important feature about subduction zones. And this is why. The reason we now know or the reason we started to figure out that Cascadia was indeed active is because of a man and dirt. So this is a famous geologist Brian Atwater from the University of Washington and also the USGS. He works in the Pacific Northwest. And here he is with one of his sites. This is a coastal marsh. And what Brian does as a geologist is he goes and he looks at dirt. And what he figured out was by looking at dirt in lots and lots of marshes uh, all, all over Cascadia was that there were lots of instances of an old marsh. So everything down below from this line is an old marsh that is now dead, covered by a layer of sand, and then on top of that a new marsh. And wherever he went to look, he would find this striking pattern. And what he proposed in the late 80s and the early 90s was that what was going on was this. That subsidence made the old marsh be invaded by the tsunami and eventually die. And the tsunami would invade the land and deposit a, a layer of sand. And eventually, a new marsh would grow on top of that. And you repeat this over time, and you would get this pattern of old marsh sand, new marsh, and so on and so forth, pretty much everywhere you look in Cascadia. So he wrote a paper, a couple of papers about this, and got people talking. And then he also proposed that this very uh, well-known feature in the Cascadia subduction zone was produced by the same mechanics. This is the ghost forest in Oregon. These are Sitka spruce trees that have all died. Now, this used to be a coastal forest. Um, you can see up here uh, on this little island, this, the, the coastal forest is still very well much alive. But down here, close to the water, the, the, the forest has died completely. All the trees are, are gone. Only the tree trunks remain. So he proposed that the same mechanism was operating here, that what happened was that there was rapid subsidence during an earthquake and then a tsunami invaded the land. And because these trees cannot survive in salt water, the brackish waters of the tsunami had led for the, to the trees dying. The tsunami also deposited a thin layer of sand. And eventually the whole thing recovered and a new uh, set of soil was deposited on top of the trees. But the trees could no longer live and eventually they all died, leading to this sort of ghost forest feature that is seen all over Cascadia. So two pieces of evidence, the marshes and the forest. So the third piece of evidence, so now, you know, this is maybe the middle of the 90s and now we're, you know, more or less thinking that, yeah, okay, maybe Cascadia does actually make earthquakes, but it's still not a slam dunk. So this was the next and perhaps the uh, final and more devastating piece of the puzzle in the late 90s. Uh, marine geologists from Oregon State University and other universities 
went out on actually one of the Scripps ships on the, on the Melville, and they went out and they cored, they obtained the sediment cores up and, up and down of Cascadia, and what they were looking for was evidence of uh, a phenomenon known as a turbidity current. A turbidity current is just a fancy name for an underwater mudslide. So an underwater mudslide sediment comes rushing down uh, the continental slope. You can imagine in this case maybe sediment from the Columbia River, which is very sediment rich. For some reason there's a mudslide and it channels or barrels down all these channels looking something like this. Now turbidity currents when they finally make a stop and they settle down, they look, they leave a very particular signal, they're, they're known as turbidites. So what these marine geologists were looking for was turbidites. They were looking for signals from turbidites in all of these marine channels. And they found them. They found lots and lots and lots and lots of them. Everywhere they looked they were able to find um, turbidites. This is what one of these cores looks like. It's basically you sink a pipe into the ocean floor and then you pull it up and you look at what came out. This is basically again geologists and dirt. And you look at this dirt and you can analyze the patterns of the sediment and they found many of these turbidites and they were able to date them and to correlate them. They were able to correlate turbidites from very far away and determine that they happened at the same time. So they were able to find a turbidite up here in the north that happened at the same time as a turbidite thousands of miles away in the south. And their conclusion was that they had found um, at least 43 events and the assumption is that each turbidite corresponds to an earthquake. And they found at least 43 events in the last 10,000 years, which means that there's a recurrence interval of 243 years, more or less, in between each one of these events. And the last one of them was 315 years ago. So if you kind of do the math, you know, 315 minus 243, we're overdue by 72 odd years. So now, mid 90s, late 90s, we're pretty much convinced that Cascadia can make these big earthquakes. And you know, we start thinking about the hazards that that makes. And the final, final, final piece of the puzzle and one of the uh, more beautiful ends to a scientific story that I've ever seen comes from this. All of those pieces of evidence were neatly tied in a bow because in Japan this is a map of the Tokugawa shogunate as it existed in the year 1700. This is imperial Japan 300 or, or odd so years ago. There was a very famous tsunami in Japan in the year 1700. A famous tsunami because there was no shaking. The Japanese are very used to earthquakes. They're very used to tsunamis. Whenever they're shaking they expect the tsunami to happen some minutes afterwards. And there was this one tsunami in 1700 that had no shaking. And it has been very well documented because there was a very um, hierarchical structure of government in Japan at the time and they documented everything. So at these sites that are circled here and here and here, in this old map, there are government records of people claiming losses because of this tsunami. So these are the, the primary sources and this is the, the synthesis of that. Basically there were buildings lost, houses lost, rice paddies damaged, people died and it was documented at many of these points. And the inevitable conclusion was that that correlated almost perfectly with the last event that happened in the Cascadia subduction zone. And after dating these trees through the science of dendrochronology, basically through looking at tree rings, what scientists determined is that all these trees of this ghost forest, they all died at exactly the same time in the year 1700. So between the evidence from this and the uh, historical evidence from Japan, we now know that the last event on the Cascadia subduction zone was at some time in the night of January 26th of the year 1700. It doesn't get much better than that if you're a paleoseismologist. So now we know. We now know. And this is the final animation from uh, the good work that people have done uh, led by Chris Goldfinger at, the, at Oregon State University. What I'm going to show you here is a video that they produced which I think is just stunning of the last 10,000 years of the Cascadia subduction zone. What I'm going to show you, this is basically from Northern California through to the Can US Canada border. This is Vancouver Island right here. Every time that this red area lights up, that is an earthquake and they've estimated the length and width of the earthquake from correlating these turbidites. So for example, this earthquake was about a magnitude 9 that ruptured the whole subduction zone approximately 10,000 years ago. And when you see these red areas, what we're looking at is, a, is the slip, if this is a cutaway of the subduction zone, remember these earthquakes happen because this oceanic plate sinks beneath the continent and the earthquake happens here at this contact between the two. So this is actually a representation of this area. So I'm going to play that and 
It should begin to go forward. So that's T19 was the last earthquake. And as we go forward, you'll see that's now T18. That was another event that happened. So we're coming back from the past. We're coming towards the present. You see they're not always that big. That's a magnitude 9. Sometimes there's some smaller ones. That's probably a low magnitude 8 or a high magnitude 7. Then another magnitude 9. Then this guy perhaps a medium magnitude 8, another magnitude 9. And here's the name of the event. This is about 7,000 years before present time. So you can see that Cascadia is really not that quiet. It actually makes very, very big earthquakes. It just doesn't make the small ones. So I would say that Cascadia actually screams a lot. So this is about 6,000 years before present and it's still going. And you know, you'll notice a pattern. It seems to make either very big ones or some event that is smaller and just in the south. So there is some, you know, spatial variability to the events. They're not always the same earthquake. T9. So we're getting closer to present time. This is 3,000 years before present. This is maybe a high 8. <coughs> Definitely a 9. Perhaps a medium 8. Another one. And so it keeps going. So you can see that by teasing out the information from looking essentially at this marine dirt, we've been able to figure out this is 1,500 years into the past. We've been able to figure out pretty much the whole seismic history of Cascadia. There's still a lot to do. The width of these guys is not very well constrained. Um, this should keep, keep going now. This is 1,500 years before present. Perhaps a, a, a magnitude 8, another 9, another 8, and on and on. You see, you get the picture. These are more common than, than we knew until maybe a decade ago. So this is 480 years ago. And then the final event, the 26th of January event that broke the whole thing and likely a magnitude 9. So it is the really big one. And I want to transition now. I hope you're convinced that pretty much that big earthquakes happen in Cascadia is as close as you get to a scientific certainty. Now let's talk about the byline of this earthquake. It was billed as the earthquake that will destroy Seattle. Okay, I hope I've convinced you that big earthquakes happen there, but is that really true? Can we expect very large damage in the, in the Pacific Northwest? So there are two things that will happen likely during one of these uh, big earthquakes. First there will be shaking damage. So first there will be the shaking from the earthquake itself and that's going to have some impacts. This is a, an important statistic to keep in mind. There were no building collapses in Tokyo during the 2011 magnitude 9 earthquake. No building collapses in the metropolitan area of Tokyo. Why? Because of building codes. Because the Japanese are subject to earthquakes so frequently that they've really beefed up their building codes to make sure that buildings no longer kill anybody there. Now in the Pacific Northwest, if you go to downtown Seattle, this is the scene that you'll see. This is unreinforced masonry. Basically these are brick buildings where what's holding the building up is the actual bricks themselves. It turns out that that's not good. So. <laughs> This is a, a video I, that I will start up. This is a, the, this is a, a to scale simulation though. So this is a, a, a mock up of a small house, so two small houses. So this one is reinforced, this one is unreinforced and they'll, they'll go at the same time. To give you an idea, to give you an idea of how these again in places where there is unreinforced masonry in a seismic area. So this is from the, the Nepal earthquake earlier this year. This is the same thing we saw in Haiti in 2010 and it's more than likely what Seattle and the Pacific Northwest is going to look like because there is no legislation on unreinforced masonry and in Seattle alone there are more than a thousand URM buildings and only 15 percent of those buildings have been retrofitted. And it's much worse outside of the big metropolitan areas. So this is likely something that we will have to worry about in the Pacific Northwest. The second thing that turns out to be very important during s these very large events is tsunamis. Now I'd like to start with what a tsunami does not look like. This is from, this is from the San Andreas movie that came out earlier this year. 
this is the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, if you want to put some scale into that, I don't know what the, the height is of the Golden Gate Bridge above the water, but it's going to be s several hundred feet. And this, you know, sort of surfable looking wave um, <laughs> is what Hollywood imagines that tsunamis look like. That's not what they look like. Um, some things that are interesting about this uh, still from the movie are the fires. This actually is going to be perhaps a problem during big earthquakes, usually fires that, you know, shaking severs gas mains and things like that. During the 1906 earthquake, as a matter of fact, the fire was the biggest problem in the San Francisco area. But again, no, this is not what those look like. I'm going to show you uh, some videos from the 2011 Japan tsunami, which is a very, very, very large tsunami. So to compare to this, so keep that image in your head. Now this is the first video. This is in Senriku in North Japan. I will start this video in a second. Right now we're looking at 30 minutes after the earthquake. So imagine yourself, it's the 11th of March in Northern Japan. It's very cold. It's just above freezing at this time. It had snowed the day before. And there's a 10 foot seawall right there. You just felt very strong shaking. Not so strong that it knocked you off your feet, but very strong, and it went on for very long, probably for one or two minutes. So you're still shaken up by that, but it's been 28 or 27 minutes since that shaking, so you're beginning to think that maybe the worst is over, and then this is what happens. So this is a coastal inlet. This right here is the first tsunami wave there to arrive. So that tiny looking thing that is the diametrical opposite of what Hollywood thinks is going on is the first tsunami wave. So you can see the seawall right there. Those seawalls are about 10 foot high. You can see these uh, fi fishing vessels that are moored there. And that is the first tsunami. You see the birds have realized there's a tsunami going on and they're, you know, booking it far away. <laughs> but most people are still driving there. They have no idea that there's a major catastrophe about to unfold because it takes some time. So tsunamis, if you want to think about them, they're more like storm surges during large hurricanes. It's basically the sea level starts to rise and rise and rise slowly but inexorably over a long, long time. So you can see now the tsunami is building. And if we fast forward a little bit, now we're 35 minutes after the start of the earthquake. Some of these fishing vessels have been uh, pulled from their moorings. And you can see that it just grows and grows and grows. So it's not yet that dramatic. Now, remember that there's a 10-foot seawall here. In Cascadia, there will be no seawalls. There are no seawalls. So this would already be uh, inundating the land. So that one's capsized and overturned. And then if we uh, fast forward to 40 minutes after the start of the earthquake, you finally pull all the vessels from their moorings and then the tsunami will finally be higher than the actual seawall. And this continues to rise. It's not going to stop just because it's overturned the seawall. And the force of this is mind-blowingly large. Remember that ankle deep water can make a human being fall. So this is way more than ankle deep. So much so that it will begin to pull these buildings straight out of their pilings and float them away like they're just toys. Now, imagine a scene like this over hundreds of miles of coastline. So that's the damage that we're talking about during a large tsunami. I had the relative good fortune because it's very informative to, to visit these sites of, of visiting uh, the site of some of these uh, catastrophic tsunamis. One year after the Japan event, I took this picture one, one year and one day after the earthquake. You can see that the area has been more or less sanitized. This used to be just rubble. And over the, that 365 day period, they cleaned most of the rubble. But this is an apartment building, a four, four or five story ap apartment building. And what's noticeable about this, this is the pile. So if this uh, about 20 foot chunk of reinforced concrete used to be buried in the ground. It was the actual foundation of the building. And it's there to stabilize the building for uh, strong shaking during earthquakes. And basically the tsunami floated this building up and out of its pile and deposited it on its side. So there's no building code that can protect you against this. You can protect against uh, seismic shaking, but a, a large tsunami is more or less unstoppable. This is another scene from another town in the coastal Japan, a bus on top of one of these buildings. 
Um, this is, was a school. We had the opportunity to you know, visit through the school. It's a very eerie sight. There were still, uh, the lesson was still on the board. There, were, you know, there was a baseball glove in one of the rooms. There were photo albums around the, the school. So that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Now, I feel a little bad when I give talks like this because I really think that in spite of these rather uh, somber things that we're talking about, it's not all doom and gloom. And I think that the reason for that is that we have learned in leaps and bounds over the last 30 years. Less than 30 years ago, we did not know that Cascadia could produce earthquakes like, like these. And now we know. And, and because we know, we can prepare for what will happen. But we have to do it now. And in the Northwest, there's uh, plenty of things that need to be done. Uh, building codes need to be seriously thought out, rethought. And earthquake early warning technologies should be fully funded to become part of what the public has access to. And shaking alerts, so earthquake early warning for shaking is more or less uh, certainly going to become a reality in the near future. Sun tsunami warning is still, I think, a little bit of a research topic, so it's not ready for prime time. So let's talk about that a uh, little bit more. So what are we going to do now that we have all this knowledge? What are we going to do moving forward? Now, I. Don't pretend to say that the Pacific Northwest should just copy the California building code. There are many things that are different about the Pacific Northwest than, than California. But the current building standards in the Pacific Northwest that allow the building of unreinforced masonry and that don't mandate retrofits is very clearly insufficient. We're going to see a lot of this if there's a large earthquake. So perhaps the California building code can be a path or can be you know, a road map to what needs to be done in the Northwest. That's what I call a simple old solution because we know very well that if the building code is cleverly thought out and it's executed properly, it's perfect. And that's why in Tokyo we, we saw almost no damage due to that magnitude 9 earthquake. There are some new technologies that, that can be used. Um, well, they're not so new in some parts of the world. Actually, in Japan, this thing called the base isolator is very, very common. I'll, I'll explain what this is. So this is a very large chunk of rubber and, and lead that is basically, um, it's a shock damper for the building. So these large buildings, um, apartment buildings or critical infrastructure like hospitals are built on top of these um, rubber dampers. And then they uh, are not so prone to uh, shaking. Now, in the west coast of the US, I think there are maybe something like 10 or 15 buildings that have base isolation, while in places like Japan, it's pretty much the standard for building large buildings. Now, let me show you uh, that base isolation works. So this is research carried out by the Jacobs School of Engineering here at UCSD. I don't know if you're aware of this, but they have this incredible piece of gear. This is the outdoor shake table. It's off of the 15 by the, by the Miramar Air Base. And what this thing allows the engin structural engineers at UCSD to do, and other places, other universities can use the shake table, is to run full scale simulations. This is a full scale five story building. I was up and down this building. It has stairwells, it had functioning sprinklers, it had an Otis elevator. Um, and it was built to, and the elevator ran actually, and it was built to simulate critical infrastructure. So this is actually uh, supposed to be an operating room. And there was, the next room was supposed to be an ICU, something like that. And what they did is they built this building, they instrumented it everywhere, and then they can run the shake table and make, plug in recorded earthquakes into the shake table and make the building move. So I'm going to show you two videos. The first video is without these base isolators, which is this one. So the earthquake has started already. You'll see the shake table is this uh, steel platform. It'll begin to move. This is a column in the first floor. This is a column in the third floor. There's lots of stuff going on here. This is an air conditioning unit. There's a water chiller. Pay attention to what's going on in the operating room. All these things that are in the operating room, these non-structural components, beds, monitors, things, are flying everywhere. And you'll start to see the damage happening where the column is coupled to the ground. This is water from the cooling unit. So 
So this is a replay of a magnitude 8 earthquake. And you can see there's very serious damage to this building. Actually during this test one of the stairwells collapsed completely. So that had this uh, earthquake happened, had this building been, sub been a real building subjected to this earthquake, it would have been red tagged and not been available for use anymore. Now I'm going to show you a second example. It's the same building. This is actually a test that was conducted before, a, a month before the test that I, I just showed you. And they put the building on these base isolators, these big uh, rubber lead dampers. And what you're going to see is this is the shake table and this is the foundation of the building and this arrow sort of gives you an idea of the relative motion between the two. And you'll see that there's a lot of motion. The base isolator deforms quite a bit. And you'll see that because these squares that are here will turn into parallelograms as the thing deforms. So this here looks very dramatic. But if you then look at the building, you'll see that the building is not moving that much. Actually, it's barely moving. And you can tell because the stuff inside here in this operating room is going to move, but just a little bit. So here's that base isolated test. Very dramatic, but notice that the building is pretty much not doing anything. So this is one of a new solution um, to preparing for strong earthquake shaking. It is unfortunately a little bit more expensive, but if uh, critical infrastructure is important to you, then this is something that you might want to consider. So the second thing that uh, we really need to press hard on is earthquake early warning. Now I don't know how aware you guys are about the story of earthquake early warning in the west coast, in particular in California. You actually have an operating earthquake early warning system right now today. Capable of delivering alerts. I actually have an app on my phone that will give me an alert whenever I get a warning. Whenever there's an earthquake. The problem is that it's a test system. It's not widely available to the public because it's a research system that is uh, uh, researched and operated by Caltech and Berkeley and the University of Washington and the University of Oregon. And because they don't have, they have funding to do the research, but they don't have funding to make the system public. Think about what it would entail to turn this on for millions of people on the west coast of the US. That being said, this system does deliver alerts today to test users. One of the test users is BART, the trains in the Bay Area. They automatically stop their trains. They're hooked up to this. And there are some other test users, the city of San Francisco um, and uh, firehouses throughout the Bay and some, some in LA. And this is uh, what that app would look like on your computer. It looks a little different on your phone. But I'll, I'll show you a simulation of a large a magnitude 8 or 7.9, a large earthquake, much like the shakeout earthquake. It will start out here in the Salton Sea. And what you'll see here is for a person in LA, this is the kind of alert that they would receive if there was that magnitude 8 earthquake that started in the Salton Sea. This is the expected intensity here. It's the strength of shaking. Anyway, let's just start that up. So at first, the earthquake has just started. The system thinks the 6.5. And it tells you, OK, you have about 60 seconds before shaking intensity 3, which is weak. But then as the earthquake grows and the system has more measurements, it starts updating the alert level from that 3 to an expected intensity of 4, which is light shaking. And all the time, this clock is winding down. And then again, as the system measures more and more of the earthquake, now it's moderate shaking expected. Now it's a 7.5. The earthquake continues to grow and the system continues to accumulate more data and more measurements. And by about 30 seconds, I think by about 25 seconds, this will grow. And you will now have an estimate in the Los Angeles area of very strong shaking expected because this is a very, very big earthquake. But you have a lot of time. So you've had a, about a minute until now to do something about this. <laughs> Which means that you have to start thinking about what you would do with this kind of warning. So what do you do with that kind of thing? So the system is called ShakeAlert. It's uh, the public face of it is the USGS, but there are many universities behind it. What could you do? If you're the public, if you're just a normal citizen, what is usually recommended is drop, cover, and hold on. You know, if you have time to turn off your stove or um, stop things from burning, that, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, safely stop a vehicle. 
If you're a businesses, if, if you're a business personnel, move to a safe location. If you have automated systems, maybe have them uh, stop and shut down or placed in uh, safe mode. For medical services, this is a very big deal. If somebody is operating or is, um, you know, has the scalpel inside of you, you'd want him to pull that back. For emergency responders, there's lots of things that could be done. Uh, turns out that during the Northridge earthquake, one big problem is that firehouse doors were deformed because of the shaking, so it took them a little while to be able to put, uh, open the firehouse door immediately after the earthquake. So if you had a minute of warning, you can pull the firehouse door open before the str uh, strong shaking happens. If you're PG&E, you can protect your power stations and grid facilities from the strong shaking so that after the earthquake, power will come on much faster than if you hadn't done any of this. So there's plenty of stuff that you can do with earthquake early warning. Now the battle, again, this system already works. What is going out now at uh, state assemblies and at the federal level is the battle for funding because this needs to be funded for the long term, not just you know over the next uh, election cycle. And finally, we can also use things, uh, these products from earthquake early warning to issue tsunami warnings for places like Cascadia. Now this is not as mature as the earthquake early warning. This is a, a video that I made for the earthquake in Chile uh, two or three weeks ago, big magnitude eight earthquake. We can take this sort of earthquake early warning information and make very fast uh, models, guesses of what the tsunami is going to be. This is the tsunami propagation. We're able to make these models one to two minutes after the start of the earthquake. And then we can translate these models into warning maps that we can potentially deliver to people. So if you can imagine, this is the equivalent in Chile of uh, counties. We've colored each county by the height of the tsunami that is expected there. We could potentially deliver these maps in the first minutes after the onset of shaking. So for Cascadia, what that would look like, these are all the counties there in the Pacific Northwest. We would be able to place a color on each one of these counties based on the expected tsunami and potentially do this in the first, I would say definitely in the first five minutes after the start of the earthquake. And what you're looking at is usually the tsunami takes about 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes to arrive to the shore. So you would have plenty of time for warning. So these are, there are many things going on and I'll just finish with this very simple slide that I call the natural hazards triangle. I live down here in the science and technology part of the triangle. I sometimes make forays into the education and outreach part of the triangle. But there are other things that need to be done. There's plenty of policy in terms of planning and prevention and you know, battles for congressional funding of these kinds of things and to convince people that these are things that are important. So it's not just the science and technology. It really is up to civil societies to take ownership of these kinds of problems and do something about it. And what we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest um, thankfully, because of this article, is that lots of people are talking about these things, so uh, no publicity is bad publicity, and I'm glad to be here today and that we're talking about these things, and uh, I will take your questions. Thank you. The question is, for the 2011 uh, Japan earthquake and tsunami, what is the highest above normal sea level um, that was observed? Um, about 20 meters, which if for the not metrically inclined, it's about 60 feet. Um, that is at the exact point of the coast, but there were places far inland, actually let me show you um, this picture. For the places further inland, like uh, you know, something like I'm showing here in this, in this picture, um, there were actually places where it was up to 100 feet, and it was not, yeah, so no, not, not nearly as bad as that, but there were places, especially in the very narrow channels, you can actually see this denudation here is because of the tsunami. And there were places where these things were very narrow where actually you know, the splash can make that go from those 60 feet maybe a little bit more. So this was really a very, very, very large event. Yeah. That was probably from, so the question is for when we were watching that video of the tsunami, one of the first things that comes over the seawall is a van. That was probably from further downstream and it was just floated back. It must have been caught in a little eddy. Actually researching the flow of tsunamis through the built environment is something that is very much in vogue right now because there are people who think that maybe we can, you know, have building codes. If buildings are built in special ways that will um, be able to resist these tsunamis and enable to think about those building codes, we need to understand the flow of water through the built environment and things like that. Yeah. So the question is how far up the Columbia River the tsunami would flow. It's, it's hard to say. Um, I haven't actually run any of these models, but I can tell you that during the, again, during the Japan tsunami, which is our most recent experience with something very large, the inundation distance, so the distance onshore that the tsunami can come, can be well over a kilometer in very, very flat areas. So 
being safe in a tsunami is a function of being in high, on high ground. So in places where it's very, very flat, the inundation can be very, very long. Yeah. yeah. So the, the question is, uh, what happens to the Puget Sound during a tsunami? It's very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult for tsunamis to um, come into these uh, coastal uh, areas, especially the Puget Sound. Once the tsunami hits shallow water, it starts to feel the friction of the ocean floor and it tends to dissipate and stop. It's very hard for tsunamis to invade the very shallow areas. I think there isn't a, a risk of very large inundation in Puget Sound. There are other problems. Uh, the speed of the currents, even if the tsunami is small, the speed of the currents can be enough to you know, pull ships from their moorings and things like that. So I don't think that you would see you know, 60 feet of inundation in Puget Sound, but there might still be damage to port infrastructure. Yeah, so the question is um, essentially what happens, um, not in Japan, but during these large events, what happens further south in the, in the coastal California waters? Um, yeah, these tsunamis can be, can be far-reaching, and actually uh, these turbidites, um, these um, cores, uh, have been correlated very far south, so the shaking from the event um, can produce uh, these mud flows far away from the actual um, source size, and the tsunami will move south, um, the exact height and amplitude of it will depend on what kind of earthquake it is and all that. But you should expect impacts from a large Cascadia tsunami in coastal California. So when we think about making these warning maps, you know, where we color the counties orange, red, or yellow, that includes California. We should be able to say, you know, for Orange County, yellow, but for San Diego County, maybe green, not so much. Um, but yeah, there should be impacts from a large magnitude 9 earthquake all up and down the west coast. Yeah, so the question is that usually, um, especially in, in the movie that I showed, actually the first tsunami arrival is actually the retreat of the ocean. Is, can that be modeled? Is that taken into account? And whenever we make those models, the subsidence of the coastal areas is always taken into account because the coast can subside five, six, seven feet, and that will change the impact of the tsunami. So it's definitely something that we take into account. So for the most part, uh, the first arrival will be this receding water. It doesn't always have to be that way, but most of the time it is. Well, that, that's why I guess that, very, that to summarize that is that it's going to be hard to convince people in the Northwest to change their attitudes towards building codes. And absolutely, and that's why there's a triangle, and I live in one corner of it, and I'm happy to talk to you about so that you, know, you can tell your friends, and if some of you are influential, you can tell other people that this is something that we need to take seriously. And the problem in Cascadia is that it's so quiet, we don't have small earthquakes like we do here, and it's hard to keep, you know, human beings have a short uh, time span that they remember things for. So yes, it's definitely a challenge, but as I said, we now know a lot, and this is very certain that is going to happen at some point, so we need to do something about it. So, so the question is if, if we've had any success or if there's been, you know, what are, what are the efforts in talking to uh, regulatory agencies in, in the Northwest and things like that? So the University of Washington as of only about, so the Earthquake Early Warning Program, Shake Alert, has been going on for, for probably a decade. And the University of Washington has been a very active part of that program for maybe the last three years. So the fact that they're involved now means that we have a foothold in that area and the scientists there are very invested in this project and they're constantly talking to people there. So it might be a slow process, as it often is with, with people, but it's, you know, it's a process that is moving forward, I think. So the question is basically how does my, um, my few slides on tsunami warning relate to NOAA's efforts in terms of tsunami warnings? And I'm, I'm glad you, you, you brought that up and perhaps we can talk about that a little bit more um, afterwards, but yes. No doubt. NOAA has championed uh, tsunami warning in the world, not just in the U.S., for the better part of two decades. And they've invested a lot in science and technology to be able to do that. Now, the way that uh, NOAA designed its tsunami warning system is for global tsunamis, for if there's a, an earthquake in Chile to warn Hawaii. It's not for local tsunamis because at the time it was thought that that was unfeasible. And that's why I'm saying that this is still sort of a research effort because we're showing that actually there are ways to make that feasible. So the way that the NOAA system is built now, the first warnings are issued in about 30 minutes. And as I said, the first arrivals will be in about 10 or 15. So there is a little bit of a gap there in terms of the local warning problem. Yes. Yes. So, so, so the second part of your question is, will it be 10 or 15 minutes before the tsunami arrives? Yes. So it's, a fun it's not always that rule. It's a function of how long your continental slope is offshore. 
But for Cascadia, it's between 10 and 15 minutes before the first wave arrives. And another thing that I didn't talk about is that tsunamis can be destructive, not just the first wave, but the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Um, so, you know, that also bears into it. Okay, so the question is if there's an explanation for why the um, Cascadia tsunami is, or the earthquake is about 60 years overdue. Um, this is a, actually a difficult question. It's not necessarily overdue. So there were um, those events, that number of events over 10,000 years, and on average, that means that they're 243 years apart. But sometimes they're, you know, longer apart. Sometimes they're closer together. Um, fault systems, earthquake systems, are very chaotic. They're not predictable at all. So there's no reason why um, sometimes they're very space, space and time very closely together, sometimes not so much. So it's kind of overdue, but you know, we've seen earthquakes in Cascadia be spread that far apart, so it's not that uncommon. But it does mean that you know, it's a mature fault that is you know, close to the end of its cycle. So the question is basically, what's the status of Southern California building codes? And I am going to um, sidestep that question because I am not a structural engineer, but I do have an opinion about it, and it is that uh, Southern California, California building codes in general, should and are very, very good. That doesn't mean that they're infallible because every earthquake we learn something new. Remember, plate tectonics is less than 50 years old, and the first seismometer is about 100 years old. So we've only been looking at earthquakes for a very short amount of time. In that amount of time, we've gained a great amount of knowledge, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. So there's always a chance that something weird, that something that we hadn't thought about might happen during an earthquake. That being said, if your building is up to code, there's a very good chance that you're going to be safe. 